Tonight, the political makeover to the prime minister's front bench. New details on the eve of a summer cabinet shuffle. Who's in and who's out? You're seeing Trudeau trying to see if he can improve his image and his government's image. An attempt to reset the narrative on affordability. There's no way I can, I can, I can pay that much money. A tragic discovery after the Nova Scotia floods. Searchers recovered the body of a child. And the unrelenting search for the last victim as the impact from the deluge threatens to extend beyond the province's borders. Plus, a life and death scare involving the 18-year-old son of an NBA superstar. It's always uh, more surprising and, and uh, alarming when somebody so young has these events. Ronnie James collapses on the court. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. Some of the most powerful political positions in this country are about to be filled with new faces in a significant shakeup to the prime minister's frontline team. By this time tomorrow, we will know exactly what that cabinet refresh looks like. But tonight, CTV's Kevin Gallagher has a preview of which ministers are on the move or being dropped altogether. More foreshadowing of a cabinet shuffle at this Green Jobs announcement today as Parliamentary Secretary Greg Fergus stood in for Treasury Board President Mona Forche. Sources tell CTV News Minister Forche will be cut from cabinet tomorrow along with Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino and Justice Minister David Lametti. Four other ministers are also leaving after telling the Prime Minister they will not seek re-election, including Transport Minister Omar al -Gabra. The Prime Minister deserves a cabinet who is committed to running in the next federal campaign. This was not an easy decision. It's always tricky to figure out the best timing for such a step, but I feel it's the right time for me. CTV News has also learned Defence Minister Anita Anand will become the next Treasury Board President, and former Toronto Police Chief Bill Blair will step into defence. Sources confirm four ministers are staying put. Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, Industry Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne, and Environment Minister Stephen Guilbeault. Setting the stage for what's being described as a significant shakeup. I wholeheartedly will serve in any capacity, and I'm saying that to you. So we'll all have to wait and see. Uh, we know what tomorrow is. Sources say the government is looking to put strong communicators into roles that tackle critical issues, including the rising cost of living, housing, and the green economy. I'm going to be interested to see the ministers who fall under the security portfolio, ministers who fall under the housing and the economic portfolio. This new look front bench will get to work right away. CTV News has learned the prime minister is scheduling the next cabinet meeting for tomorrow afternoon. Omar. All right, Kevin, thank you. And as Kevin mentioned, affordability is a major concern for Canadians these days, especially when it comes to housing. The combination of higher interest rates and limited supply is putting a strain on family finances. As CTV's Judy Trin reports, the solutions are clear. What is less obvious is the will. In Toronto, the city opened up more than 200 shelter spaces in response to refugees being forced to sleep on the streets. In Vancouver, a tent city has emerged. It's a nationwide crisis erupting in regular protest. Who are we? Hey, Corn! What do we want? Affordable housing! We're losing affordable housing more than we're uh, creating it. In Ottawa, older buildings with affordable rent are being torn down and longtime tenants are being evicted. Manuel Kua has a full time job that pays $23 an hour. Right now, his rent is less than $500 a month. In the new building, it could cost him two thousand dollars. There's no way I can I can uh, I can pay that much money. Economists say all levels of government need to work together to build more apartments and houses. Affordability is widely defined as rent or mortgage payments that do not exceed thirty percent of income. To get to that balance, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says Canada needs to double its construction of homes from three point five million to 7 million units. We hope that uh, low-income households 
maybe their younger people, as they age, as they gain more income, they will want to move into better housing. But unfortunately, at the moment, that better housing is undersupplied. Increasing supply isn't easy when there aren't enough workers. Providing work visas to bring in tradespeople from other countries could make a difference. Immigration, in fact, is one of the answers to those challenges, to have people come in from, from overseas who have those skills and, and talents. But a solution is still years away, even if housing construction is doubled. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation estimates it will still take at least until 2030 before supply meets demand. Omar. All right, Judy, thanks. A former Mountie accused of helping China conduct foreign interference has been granted bail but is banned from leaving Canada. William Miker has been charged under the Security of Information Act. CTV's Vanessa Lee was at the court hearing today. And Vanessa, what else do we know about his bail conditions? Omar, William Miker was supposed to appear by teleconference from a B.C. detention centre but because of technical issues, we only heard his voice on speakerphone as he agreed to the bail conditions. He must remain in Canada, surrender his passport, make a $50,000 deposit with the court, and report to the RCMP every week. Two sureties have also agreed to deposit an additional 200000 The Crown is satisfied that, uh, and the court was satisfied that these conditions are sufficient to uh, guarantee his return to court. Police allege Miker used his network of Canadian contacts to obtain intelligence or services that benefited the People's Republic of China. Under the Security of Information Act, the Crown has the right to lay foreign interference charges from any jurisdiction in the country. Prosecutors say they chose to do it here in Quebec because it was convenient and the investigative team is in Montreal. Miker's next court appearance is scheduled for August 29th. His lawyer told the judge he plans to plead not guilty. Omar. All right, Vanessa, thank you. Police in Nova Scotia made another heartbreaking revelation today that the body of a second child swept away during the province's flash flooding has been found. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Najgate on the search efforts and the potential impact that could extend far beyond the province's borders. Nova Scotia's devastating deluge has also brought with it a torrent of grief. RCMP today revealed the body of a second child who was swept away during flash flooding has been recovered. Both are believed to be related to the four people who reported missing on July 22nd. RCMP say on Saturday morning at 4 a.m. a Ford pickup truck and an SUV became submerged and were pushed into a field by rising floodwaters. The two children in the SUV went missing, along with a man and a youth in the pickup truck. The body of a 52-year-old man from Windsor was found yesterday. They were leaving their residence, trying to get to uh, a safe area, and that's when they were struck with the storm surge. The whole entire province is sick with mourning for the, the loss of uh, three souls now. The search continues for the remaining missing youth under 18. The news today will allow three members of families to have closure. That search is taking place as the province is trying to recover. We were swept away so fast. Kimberly Gillingham has a fractured knee and leg but is thankful to be alive. After a volunteer firefighter from Brooklyn where the search is taking place carried her to safety from rising floodwaters. He was tethered with the other firemen which was really good. <laughs> Thank God. He held on to me for his dear life or else I wouldn't be alive here today. Still no timeline on when this CN rail line, the only one connecting the port of Halifax to the rest of Canada, will reopen. The critical link brings in $4 billion a year to Nova Scotia's economy and the disruption threatens to restrict the flow of container goods from Halifax to Montreal, Toronto and Chicago. 60% of the cargo that moves through Halifax is rail based. You know, it comes in from overseas locations like Southeast Asia or Europe. Police have been using industrial pumps to drain water from a field as the search continues for that fourth person. Omar. All right, Creason, thank you. On the West Coast, much needed rain brought some relief for frontline crews fighting a wildfire near Kamloops, BC. Uh, we're lucky. It was cool, but we certainly know this weather won't last. And before long, we will be back into those deep drought conditions that, you know, see, that let this, uh, you know, extreme fire behavior activity happen. 
As that fire continues to burn out of control, new aggressive flames have been spotted in the region. I just came out of the door and looked and it was there so fast. It was like an hour and it was just giving her and it was pluming very, very good. Dozens have been forced to leave their homes and more than a thousand properties, including a ski resort, are threatened. The province has more than 450 active wildfires. And the wildfires raging in Greece have now claimed at least three people. Two of them died today in a fiery crash while battling the fires on the island of Evia in a Canadian-made aircraft. And a warning, the images may be disturbing. The Canada airplane was seen dropping water, then crashing into a hillside before erupting in flames. Two pilots on board were killed. Fires on the Greek islands over the last week have destroyed homes and forced thousands to flee, including many tourists. And Greece's prime minister is warning of tough days ahead. The fires that swept across northern Algeria killed at least 34 people, including 10 soldiers who got encircled by flames while trying to evacuate residents. A drop in temperatures helped firefighting efforts today. There are pressing calls tonight for an independent inquiry into one of the worst public health emergencies in Canadian history. A group of top medical experts says the country failed in its response to the crisis. CTV's Heather Butts on the push for accountability after tens of thousands of COVID deaths. Just tilt your head back. Kind of like COVID-19 first hit Canada more than three years ago, leading to catastrophic deaths and infections across the country. It's important that we take this opportunity to learn from what's happened before memories start to fade. Dr. Sharon Strauss helped produce a set of papers published in a prominent British medical journal where dozens of researchers examined Canada's pandemic response, suggesting the country was ill-prepared and lacked coordination. The experts are calling for an independent inquiry looking to reform Canada's health care system. We really want this to be actionable, implementable strategies where there's an accountability. The authors say the country failed to protect vulnerable communities and racialized workers. Research points to data showing lower income communities faced higher deaths through seven waves. It does acknowledge successes, including a vaccination rate of more than 80 percent, but calls Canada a vaccine hoarder that failed to share doses globally. The biggest oversight, the staggering number of deaths in long-term care homes. It was very frustrating um, not being able to get through not being able to find out how he was. Kathy Park's father, Paul, was among the more than 14,000 people who died of COVID in long-term care homes. He was in Orchard Villa, a facility in Ontario at the center of a scathing military report on dire conditions. I just think about the people crying out for water or those who even couldn't verbally ask for help but needed it. Those who support an inquiry say it's a critical step in preparing for the next emergency. It was horrendous. And, you know, how much have we changed? How much have we adapted? How much have we learned? And I would say somewhat, but not much. In a statement, the federal government says it's committed to a review of its COVID-19 response in order to better prepare. But some experts worry a review won't go far enough. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. There is concern tonight about the health of Bronny James, the son of basketball superstar LeBron James. The rookie guard at the University of Southern California suffered a cardiac arrest during practice and is now in hospital recovering. CTV's Bill Fortier on the shocking moments on the court. You gotta finish the dunk now. The elite skills of this young basketball player come honestly. That'll do it. 18-year-old Bronny James is the son of NBA legend LeBron James. Yesterday, Bronny was taken to hospital after his heart stopped during practice at the University of Southern California. In a statement, his family says he is now in stable condition and no longer in ICU and sent deepest thanks and appreciation to the USC medical and athletic staff. The early intervention saved his life. Commendations to the entire athletic staff and for those who participated in that intervention. And lowers the shoulder. In January, the NFL's DeMar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest during a game and has since recovered. Today, the Buffalo Bills safety tweeted support to Bronny and his family. It's, of course, very premature to speculate on anything at this stage. This sports medicine physician says, though rare, it can happen to anyone, even young elite athletes. And those that are younger, it's... Uh, 
it's usually uh, congenital things, so things that the person was born with. Some, including billionaire Twitter owner Elon Musk, were quick to speculate, connecting the teen's medical episode to COVID vaccines, though there's no evidence of any link. So it's a total distraction. It's smoke and mirrors, and we should just put to rest that this has anything to do with that. Elon Musk has a platform of 300 million users. According to this social media expert, misinformation is especially dangerous when it comes from someone with an online presence as big as Musk's. False information sticks. It influences people, and it takes a lot of effort and energy to unwind and unlearn what's false. Bronny James is expected to undergo several tests to figure out exactly what happened. His family has asked for privacy until they have more information to provide. Omar. All right, Bill, thanks. Coming up. It's this flexing, intentional flexing of muscles that I think is it, it threatens to turn the world of sport on its axis. Saudi Arabia shelling out on sports to cleanse its country's image. Plus, emptying the tank on a grueling swim for guide dogs. The controversial issue of sport washing is surfacing again, this time in professional soccer. A team in the Saudi Arabian Pro League is offering hundreds of millions of dollars in a massive bid for superstar striker Kylian Mbappe. CTV's Heather Wright reports. Monsieur Kylian! Considered one of the best soccer players in the world, Kylian Mbappe could soon become the world's highest paid athlete. With Saudi's Al-Hilal prepared to pay a $332 million transfer fee to his current club, plus a reported salary of $776 million to the French star. Even in the sort of riches of global football, the figures are unprecedented. This is the latest blockbuster move by Saudi Arabia, whose public investment fund owns four soccer clubs in the Saudi Professional League. The kingdom has also shaken up golf with its live tour, attracting top talent with the promise of huge paychecks, eventually merging with the PGA last month. I don't think we know all the answers as to where the Saudi regime is taking it, but they have so much money to throw at sport that nobody else can compete. That was likely a key driver behind the PGA's decision to merge with live, a partnership the tour had repeatedly said would never happen. Saudi Arabia has long been accused of using sport to launder its international reputation, trying to shift the focus away from its dismal human rights record and authoritarian rule. Sports washing is not new. The Beijing Olympics and World Cup in Qatar are recent examples, but it's never been done like this before. We're seeing this happen more prevalently now because we have a country that's willing to pay. Proponents say sport in this case could be used to foster change. Others caution the sheer magnitude of Saudi spending could lead more athletes and fans to look the other way. Once a major name goes, more will follow. And so the trend is, I would say, working. Mbappe's club Paris Saint-Germain has given permission for Al-Halal to negotiate directly with the forward. It's not clear when any decision might be made. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. And at the Women's World Cup in Australia, Team Canada is gearing up for its next game after tying its opening match last week. Tomorrow's pivotal game against Ireland can be seen on CTV and TSN. Our coverage begins at 7 a.m. Eastern, bright and early at 4 a.m. Pacific. And still ahead, the countdown to another global sporting spectacle. The stylish and sustainable Paris 2024 torch unveiled. A former American soldier held by Russia for three years and later released in a prisoner swap was injured while fighting in Ukraine. Trevor Reed has been transported to Germany for medical care. The U.S. State Department clarified the former Marine was not working for the government and it is unclear when he left for Ukraine. Reed was freed last year in exchange for a Russian pilot jailed in the U.S. on drug smuggling charges. The defining symbol of the Olympics was unveiled in the City of Light today as the one-year countdown to Paris 2024 begins. <laughs> Multiple Olympic gold medalist sprinter Usain Bolt was among the athletes posing with the torch, designed with recycled steel to mimic the ripples of the Seine. The famous river is undergoing a historic cleanup and will be used as a venue for the Games. And after 100 years, will reopen for public swimming after that. NHL star Patrice Bergeron announced his retirement today.
The Boston Bruins captain is hanging up his skates after 19 seasons. The 38-year-old played his whole career with the Bruins, leading the team to a Stanley Cup in 2011. Bergeron won the Selkie Trophy six times as the league's top defensive forward and won two Olympic gold medals with Team Canada. After the break... My shoulders got pretty, pretty sore after about 15 kilometers. A grueling swim to get guide dogs for the blind. A Vancouver swimmer successfully conquered the currents of the Strait of Georgia for a goal very close to his heart. He wanted to bring the gift of sight to those like him who no longer have it. CTV's BC Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy has his incredible story. BC's Strait of Georgia is frigid and filled with currents, but those challenging conditions did little to deter Scott Rees. That's him swimming in the waters between the province's mainland and Vancouver Island. My shoulders got pretty pretty sore after about 15 kilometers, and, and so the second half was a definite grind. The 40-year-old pushed himself physically, swimming nearly 11 hours, not for bragging rights, but for a good cause. I did it as a fundraiser for Canadian Guide Dogs for the Blind. It's the charity that set me up with my guide dog, Caleb. Caleb is a six-year-old golden lab. He's also Reese's eyesight as he navigates the world around him. Uh, I've lost my vision progressively over the last you know, 15 to 20 years. Reese has a genetic condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Until Caleb entered his life two years ago, he struggled getting to and from places. As I lost my vision, I lost my independent mobility, and he's given me a ton of freedom, and I don't need to rely on people to do everything. Can you say something? To honor Can his him? helpful yeah. pup and his charity. Ree started training months ago, first swimming in pools and then in Vancouver's English Bay. I swam uh, approximately 460 kilometers uh, of training swims prior to taking on the strait. All that hard work paid off. In the end, Ree swam 30 kilometers and raised more than $130,000. It's a very meaningful amount of money that will help other people um, get guide dogs. Help other people get their very own Caleb and hopefully regain a sense of freedom. All thanks to a long, chilly swim across the Strait of Georgia. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. It's an inspiring journey. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching and good night. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.